so nice to meet you. Um, let's see, we're gonna get started. Um, thanks everybody for being here. Um, I, uh, once again, Lindsay Baker, and I'm one of your co-hosts for the conference. Uh, and I'm super excited today uh, to introduce Dr. Andrea Shigu, uh, who's with us from MIT. Welcome, Andrea. Hi, guys. Um, and so, Andrea, I'm very excited to chat with you, um, not only because uh, the center at MIT that you direct is such an incredible center on all things related to real estate and buildings and data and all of that, um, but also because I am looking forward to having our audience hear a little bit about how research as a community plays into the work that we have to do in transforming the real estate industry. And I think that is one of those things, as you know, as I had this role at one point in my life at UC Berkeley in the Center for the Built Environment, these, these kinds of research centers are so critical for the industry to give us feedback and to really engage in the question of what happens next. So thank you for being here. Um, and I wonder if you wouldn't just start off by telling us a little bit about how you got into the work that you do and um, how that background has, has helped you understand real estate. Well, great. Thank you so much uh, for having, having me and, and thanks to the organizers uh, for bringing me along to, to hear from hear my perspective and hear um, from us here at MIT in the lab. Um, we're really grateful to be here. We're exceptionally happy to talk to you, um, Lindsay, and all of your broader experience with bringing technology and design and sustainability to the built environment. So a lifetime of work that you've been hustling, which we really, really appreciate. Um, yeah, so where, how did I get here? Um, you know, when I, when I was growing up, I never thought I would be very, very actively engaged in, um, in data science and machine learning and technology for the built environment. Um, but I, I, I got here, I got here nonetheless. So um, I headed over to the Netherlands about a, a little bit over a decade ago and started working with some of the great leaders in sustainability. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with Pete Eicholtz and Nils Kalk and learn um, from the grassroots there, especially in that social responsible investment culture that the Dutch uh, really, really foster, um, what was incredibly relevant uh, to drive forward from an equity, a bond, um, an alternative asset class perspective, and increasingly in the real estate sector. Um, and so I worked on a lot of the European projects um, at that time to try to drive an understanding of what we could do on a sustainability and energy efficiency um, front um, and to try to understand what were the technologies, uh, the design strategies, and really importantly, the financial strategies that we needed to bring home uh, to, to get buildings green. So whether it was in the commercial real estate or the residential real estate sector, we were really trying to understand what did we need to do um, and that really drove us to understand how to improve appraisal standards or how to improve underwriting standards with banks um, and, and how to then say, well, this is what you needed to look for from the technology, a design and a standards basis. And that's actually how it led me to MIT. MIT um, is where I've been asked to lead you know, the real estate innovation lab um, and work with a diverse team of about 20 people to answer a broad spectrum of questions, including those about sustainability and climate change and how they impact um, the, the technological and financial performance of buildings, both residential and commercial. Yeah, well, there's so much there. I want to just make sure to highlight one of the things that I think is so particularly interesting about the type of research that you do is that a lot of it is for the real estate industry to understand at a gut level, maybe we think these things are a good idea, but we don't always actually have the numbers to back that up. And I know from that, from the research you did um, and continue to do that those research studies are good on one level just for being able to justify the move you wanna make, right? It's a lot of that for decision makers is being able to say, here's the paper that proves the thing that we kind of figured was true. Uh, but getting that data is really hard. And so I, I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about that aspect of how um, the world of data in real estate is emerging and where you think we are in that transition of, of uh, I would say, you know, there's that sort of big picture vision of where we might get to where real estate is really run with data more actively and, you know, it can take on some autonomy and all of that stuff. But really, like, 
you know, the reality as many of us know is that there are buildings out there that have just absolutely zero data as a, as a sort of a thing, you know? So can you talk a little bit about that and how the center engages in that question where you think we are, um, where you'd yeah. like to be? Yeah, great, great question. And um, incredibly important. So actually it did, it, it got kicked off with sustainability. Um, there was a great essay written by uh, Nils Kopp, Pete Eichholz, and John Quigley, where they said, um, if you couldn't measure the energy efficiency in the building, then I couldn't tell you how to improve it or how to make a change. And um, that was a great essay because it was, it was more than a decade ago that that was written and it was actually came out just after doing well by doing good. And the, the question that you really need to answer is, I want to make a change. I don't care what change that's going to be. But if I don't know where my baseline is, what my benchmark is, then I can't make any sort of improvement or unimprovement. I, I don't know where I'm at. And so, so much of the work that I have done probably for the last decade, and then in, including that, uh, the, the wider work that we do here at the, at, at the lab and also at the Center for Real Estate, is to understand how to measure things that are happening in the built environment, how to identify what ha is happening and um, relate that back to decision makers, decision makers and stakeholders and say, hi, this is incredibly important for you to pay attention to. And the reason being is that we've collected your experience, your stories. So data science is a really sexy term for collecting people's stories and experiences. Um, hopefully ethically, hopefully with a privacy uh, uh, infrastructure that we are incredibly paying attention to as, as, as good data scientists. So good data scientists are like a therapist. They keep your secrets on lockdown and they're really listening to you. So if, <laughs> if, we're, doing, if we're good data scientists, as, as like a good therapist, if we're doing a good job, then we're being able to communicate back those experiences um, to those decision makers and helping you to make uh, improved decisions. And so my, my goal and, and you know, how sustainability has been able to do that is by baseline measuring things over time. So it started with energy bills, that's great, um, if we could get a hold of them. It started with data architectures to understand you know, the underwriting structures that we needed for housing or commercial real estate um, to get better bank loans or to get better appraisal valuations um, on, on those assets. So it's, it started with these very basic tangible things that decision makers needed, and now it's expanded more broadly. So now, now we're get, really getting going. And data science you know, for the built environment has expanded, and we've moved amazingly in the past decade. I'm incredibly proud of real estate. So some people are like, aren't you frustrated? I'm like, yes, but I'm also incredibly proud because we've gone from a, a system of saying, I don't need to collect data, to being like, actually, I need to work at this because I need to pay attention to the experiences not only of my my team but also you know our collective genius in, in making these buildings and my collective genius in underwriting these buildings right just just pay attention to our experiences yeah yeah I, I, that, that's that's what gets me excited these days about real estate frankly I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about this aspect of it is that I've always hoped that there would be a point where the data started to become so readily available that um, we could value buildings more based on what their actual job is in the economy, not just as an asset class, you know, but um, but how good they are at doing their jobs of, of housing us, you know, of, of sheltering people, which is sort of why they exist in the first place, one, one, one might point out. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, you know, especially with your background in socially responsible investing and the data that comes out of that kind of thing. I wonder, um, are you feeling optimistic about uh, the ways in which uh, sustainability and, you know, various sort of ESG metrics and things like that are starting to fit into to, uh, the lands, the business of real estate, I guess? Yeah, and I'm incredibly optimistic for two reasons. So, um, one, I'm, I'm very lucky that I've gotten to spend a, a big chunk of time here at MIT and learn from my colleagues here. So I, I have a lot of people who make stuff running around. So there, there's these inventors who are running around creating these technologies. I've got these architects and these designers running around that are trying to take these technologies and embed them to make better buildings, better things. 
And we've got engineers that are on the background that are also testing that. And so we've got this collective intelligence that's utilizing data, it's utilizing information increasingly to try to make a better building performance. So we've got this data, data science energy and even machine learning analytics starting to come in um, to, to try to make a better product. And that's incredibly exciting because they're looking at the environmental performance. They're looking at what it means to be social. That's a very tough one that we talk about. We say S, but we're like, what does this BS mean? Yeah. So we're really working on that social, right? And then really improving that governance of, of that, not only of that product, but also of that asset. So those things are coming together and over the past decade that has just overwhelmingly changed, right? So we've, we've come a long way. Of course, we have more to go. You're not done. The job is not done, but we come a long way. Now, if you think about that, that integration with the financial sector, really thinking mindfully um, about how we can integrate this incredible knowledge about how to make a great thing for humans to take care of us, to house us, like you said, right? That this is the place where we spend 90% of our time. So make it wonderful. Make it so that we thrive. And so we're really getting that, you know, that is really work getting worked out with these inventors and these designers and these engineers and the data that they're collecting on how to do that better and better. And then the institutional investment community is pairing that with their financial data and saying, ah, I can do it. I can make good stuff. I can take care of people and it's good for me. It's good for my balance sheet. They're going, wait a second, doing well by doing good is not just a joke. It is for real. So I think my, my passion comes out when I'm really talking about you know, uniting these two worlds, integrating those two data forces and really making good stuff. Because we can, we definitely can. We definitely yeah. can. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. I'm, I'm, I'm in. Um, well, so, so one aspect of the way that we do that that I would love to, for you to talk a little bit more about is smart buildings and um, what that sort of means uh, you all have done some work on it, in particular in relationship to sustainability, because at least from where I sit, and I am incredibly biased, there is uh, a pretty big correlation uh, between smart buildings and sustainable buildings, but it's not always the same. So can you talk a little bit about where you see that happening um, and just that realm of smart buildings and how it relates to sustainability? Yeah, no, I think, I think, you know, you're right. So they're, they're highly correlated. Um, and actually the, in the, the things that we needed to improve the measurements around environmental performance, social performance and governance performance, you know, it's, you know, pushed forward the intelligent building um, technological framework or technology stack um, immensely, right? So they were kind of co-moving for like 25 years from terms of embedded technologies. And then the environmental framework sort of said, wait a second, those, those technologies could be super handy if we were to borrow them and put them into the environmental framework. And so we're seeing lots of um, interesting uh, analytics dashboards, um, lots of interesting um, you know, integration of these embedded technologies that can actually speak to both types of issues. So not only uh, tenant or employee engagement, but also environmental performance of the structure. And why wouldn't you do both, right? That just makes good, good sense, good financial sense to be able to, to get double the work out of the data and the technology that you're employing. So I think in terms of the smart building technology stack, um, we've come a long way, but we're actually going even further now. So I think environmental um, considerations have supercharged smart buildings. Um, but there's, there's an argument now around the efficiency of understanding buildings more broadly across their full life cycle. So from inception, design, construction, um, you know, lease up operating or lease up or uh, owner -occup -occup occupancy, and then moving even into the dem demolition stage. Understanding the full trajectory and experience of the building is, is getting its, its super amplified rise. And that's coming from these smart building systems and the dream and the push for them to start to be able to talk to this thing called the digital twin. Now that's a very, whoa, so exciting <laughs> yeah. word right now. Like everybody's like, whoa. <laughs> it does um, sound kind of creepy as a term. So yeah, can you uh, maybe define it for us and tell us a little bit about 
how how it's uh, how it plays into all these dynamics. Yeah, so the notion, I actually, I, I'm not exactly sure that it's completely connected to the sustainability argument, but it's connected definitely to the smart building um, technology yeah. stack. And that is definitely uh, highly correlated with what's happening with green. So there is a mesh pattern that could be definitely going up, but it's it's essentially a um, a way to uh, capture data as a, da a data platform that follows um, something throughout time. So as a data scientist, we would call this a panel data or something that literally follows the object for every moment and instance in its time. Um, and then actually, you know, the, the fuller, the visualization of this is usually a volumetric display so that we would actually have a 3D digital replica of that same object that would have some sort of embedded um, connection to those smart building systems or to those environmental smart building systems that would say beep 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 your HVAC system or your HEPA filter um, it's gone bad you need to change that we're at risk for COVID or um, and these are hypotheticals but they haven't pushed this type of thing yet but there could be very easily things around um, uh, daylighting um, uh, you know in temperature controls um, that are utilized now in a, a simple dashboard, but then also enable a 3D um, visual exploration of the structure at the same time. And this is, you know, this has been used, this is actually digital twins are quite old technology. So some people call it 6D BIM. Um, and some people have actually, you know, NASA has used um, digital twins for the greater part of 45 years. I mean, we have to, they no longer yeah. build things like, Toilet paper rolls when they think that the astronauts are in trouble. <laughs> digital That's replica. good to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Um, and then I wonder if you can talk for a second about um, some of the data that you have amassed uh, in your research center. Um, you have a, a new uh, sort of beta platform um, that I'm excited about that is looking at sort of collecting a lot of data, smart buildings, systems, and all of that. Can you tell us what that is and, um, and why you have it? Yeah. So um, part of our job here in academia um, is to kind of hang out on the, uh, the leading edge of what we could do with data, for example. Um, or with technology, for example, um, in the built environment. And one of the, one of the areas that we've grown um, to explore is the, not, not only the notion of data science and its applications to real estate, but the notion of this concept called wide data. So how we're going to integrate many different features about a particular object into one data architecture um, or one and there's many different types of data architectures that we could explore, like knowledge graphs or relational databases, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea of how we're going to go about doing this, what is the best way for the industry to move forward? And how is that different from other industries? So a lot of people speak about the concept of big data, um, which is important for, for real estate, especially as we arrive at these uh, smart, connected, and green um, and even healthy building systems that are going to communicate with us with the digital twin you know, building up there. Um, but ultimately, how are we going to do this in a way that um, uh, makes sense from an from a, uh, integration perspective? So we got to do the fundamental R&D work. There are at least 20 some odd data integration companies that are out there right now, which is very exciting. We're very excited to see that moving forward so fast. Um, but we also really want to see what we should be doing on the other side. So we work on various types of data integration of different types of data. Um, big data, slow data, wide data, put them all together into one uh, data platform to be able to answer uh, questions around um, that are relevant to built environment stakeholders. So right now this database um, is, has about 5,000 variables uh, for every single building in Manhattan over a 20 year time period. Um, which you can always integrate more. I think, I think Cherry talks about having like 310,000 uh, unique variables, which I, I think is wonderful. But we, we've discovered that we need, we need about 5,000 right now to be able to answer relevant questions um, consistently. So we, we take these and we, we've concentrated them for the New York City uh, commercial and residential property markets. We've done that for about 20 years and we've created a geometric geospatial um, relational and knowledge based platform uh, to be able to answer our questions and, and push push data science um, and machine learning for the built environment forward. 
there are many other great groups that are also on the leading edge of, of answering questions around data science and data integration, but that's for another topic. But this is going to help us to answer more and more questions about what we need in terms of environmental, social, and governance structures. Um, and it's helped us to answer a lot of those questions on that the value proposition and engaging um, in the ESG strategies over the past uh, five years since we've, since we've created the database. Yeah, one of the things I'm excited about on that, and then we'll move on to something else, is just, to, it's just that for, for those of you who are feeling like maybe the data, um, the data that, that is known about your building is sort of your data, it, we're, we're past that point now. We're past that point for ourselves as individuals, right? It's not just data that I know about myself. There is a whole data set that is publicly available about me because of just the way that, um, you know, the digital world has, has come into our lives. So um, I, I like to think of it as kind of a, you know, um, it, it, it's a motivator to understand that increasingly the buildings that you own in your portfolio um, have a presence in these data sets and you have control over that, but it does mean that you, you know, have to do the things that we have to do to, to make our buildings perform well. Um, so, okay. So speaking of data and performance, I want to ask about the work that you all have done on uh, financial performance and healthy buildings, because I, especially it's so top of mind right now for people um, and you have some great new findings. I, as a reminder to everyone, this is within the context of research that has been done for years that looks at the fina financial performance of buildings, um, you know, you know, more from the perspective of sort of quote unquote green uh, characteristics, et cetera. Um, but tell us a little bit about uh, what you've found so far on the financial performance of, of healthy buildings and what that means. Yeah, no, I think also that brings up a good question about why we would even begin to answer these questions. So um, as scholars, you know, myself and many of my colleagues um, across the globe, they work on answering questions about what is the value proposition of engaging of a, you know, design and technology strategy that makes a better building. And then we take that design and technology strategy and we call it something more broadly, like a green building, or right. we call it a smart building or we call it yeah. a healthy building or a connected building or we've got these buzzwords for them that they, yeah. they have this umbrella of design and tech embedded in them so what we've sort of learned over time is that actually there's a substantial number of academic studies at this point across the globe and across product types residential uh, retail commercial uh, office uh, that that essentially points to positive financial performance of green buildings um, so somewhere between 42 and 46 studies have pointed to that. There has not been a single study that has pointed to a negative uh, uh, financial performance so far. And we've been doing this for the greater part of a decade, my, myself and my colleagues. So, so green is valuable. Um, and, and so we, we've said, okay, well, green is certainly valuable. And we want to understand, well, what are the thresholds of the technological bounds and the design bounds? That are pushing um, pushing the frontier of, of making you know better and better buildings, and so we recently did a study on smart, connected, and green buildings. And what we saw was that again we're seeing that those positive financial performance premiums um, pop up. What we don't know is the cost differential yet on the smart build, smart buildings, but we do know the cost differential, or at least some some underlying evidence on what the cost differential is for green buildings. And we found that actually the, the cost is quite marginal. It's somewhere between zero and you know, six and a quarter um, percent, which is not a very high number given the, the transaction premiums um, and the rental premiums that we're actually seeing on those assets overall. So there's still a very positive delta um, when we're looking at um, an institutional performance play on these assets, but also on a, a product by product um, basis. So then we, you know, as we push this frontier to smart, connected in green buildings, we're seeing, again, this more evidence that looked a lot like the early days of the green buildings of these high financial performance premiums. Um, and so we then wanted to answer the question, especially in light of COVID, um, about healthy buildings. Um, so healthy buildings, are it's not a new paradigm, but it's a new third party standard paradigm. So that's another sort of broader topic, but the idea is that the institutional frameworks want some sort of third party with a certificate that says that's a, that's a healthy building and that's a green one and that's a smart one. And they want to have these labels 
um, so that they can, you know, they can underwrite it. That, that, that's what really what it comes back to, the standards so that I can underwrite and I can feel good and pass that on to the pensions. Um, so if we're mindful of that framework, we went and we looked at the publicly available data of well and fit well certified um, buildings, and then we traced their rental contracts. So there haven't been enough trades because they're maybe two to three years old in terms of the number of buildings that have been certified. But we've been yeah. tracking that for, for some time now. And what we've seen so far is that the, the first look at that data um, has showed a, a, a documented uh, financial performance premium for those rents. So effective rents um, are higher somewhere between um, 3.7 and 4.2% more. So we're seeing this positive financial performance um, return over and over again. And it looks quite similar to what we see from, from product to product. So when we're pushing these standards out, we're pushing the design performance, pushing those technologies into the buildings, we are seeing um, a positive financial performance. We don't see it for all products, um, but it looks like uh, we see it on these particular ones that have to relate, that are relating to these environmental, social, governance, health, engagement type um, technology and design strategy. So, so that's interesting. We're always looking to see if there's some sort of change. I'm, and if I did, I would be super famous. You know, <laughs> the first paper that there is no no financial performance premium on these things, I would get super famous. So you would be the first to hear from me. Um, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and that makes sense, right? It's, again, it is sort of a lot of the, a lot of the importance of the research is really just, it's, it's to isolate those variables and be able to say, like, all else equal, these things really make a difference. Yeah. Um, and as you said, right, because they can then sort of, it can domino effect into the underwriters, to the pension funds, to the actual, you know, question of how the buildings are performing. Um, and it's very exciting to see. Uh, but at the, you know, at the more basic level, I don't think there's ever been a time we've been more aware of the fact that uh, if I have access to uh, natural light and good air in the space that I am working, I will probably be willing to pay more for that than if I don't, right? I mean, even just looking, I'm so excited to see all of the data on residential transactions in the past six months to a year because of decisions people made about their physical space that were really about physical space more than, you know, location and all these other things, right, that have always yep. been such a factor in, in real estate. So it's a, it's a cool time and I'm very excited to hear about the research in particular around, around um, the healthy buildings. It's, it's, a, it's a focus time. I think a lot of people are going to be investing in that and I'm excited to see it. Um, okay, so here's a question for you that I hope is a fun one. If everyone, if everyone in the real estate industry were reading your papers and listening to what you were saying and absorbing the data and the sort of the findings from the data of research that you all do, you with your colleagues, etc., what would we see change most in the landscape of our cities in terms of real estate and how real estate would change and get better? That's a great question. That's such a great question. So, I mean, we could talk about that from like a product standpoint, like what we would do to the buildings themselves. And that, I think that's, I'm going to say that, but I'd say big picture, what, if everybody was paying attention to our research, they would be collecting their data and information and integrating that with other stakeholders in the built environment. And they would do that ethically. They would do that. We would we would have ethics and we would have privacy standards that were very mindful um, of each other's, you know, areas and, and, and expertise. I, I, I get that. But yeah. if we were really, really smart about it, if we were really paying attention, we would get very organized. So right now we've just got to discover how unorganized we are from a built environment perspective. I don't know how many people from, from big banks and big large organizations have called me and said, I really wish we had a smart building already. This is <laughs> yeah. messing up my going back to work strategy. Yeah. Um, so I, what I wish for the built environment in the next decade is first and foremost, a strong data ethics and privacy 
mandate, something that is mindful of inequality and injustices. I think these mandates are incredibly important and incredibly important to get right because we have such an outsized impact on the built environment, on our health, on social justice, on climate change. I, I just think we have such an outsized impact. So yeah. if we got those things right, that would be great. And two, get organized. Listen to what people need. Listen to what your buildings need by collecting the information. And if we collect that information and sort it, organize it, we could get a little bit more mindful and thinking about what our patient needs, right? So it's just, I'm just trying to be a good therapist here. Listen to the traumas, the intergenerational traumas of the, of the childhood. So I really want us to do good organizational work. From a product standpoint, you know, we are the biggest, car, you know, one of the biggest carbon polluters. We are, we are on fire or we are, the, the water is coming over the levee. Litter, litter, We're just to be fair. <laughs> the animals are not doing very well. We are at home. We, we have been home for six months. I miss my colleagues. You know, some people never want to go back to the office, something like 20%. Never want to go back to the office, according to some of the, the research from Microsoft and EY. I want to go back in and see my colleagues. I'd like to hug other people again. So I, I think, I think that we would, would really benefit from engaging in environmental policies for our buildings because it's good for our bottom line. Smart building strategies so that we can get organized because it's good for our bottom line. You know, connected strategies because we can't actually do our jobs without fabulous broadband connectivity, right? We're so lucky this is happening now. Um, and then where we're at in the internet's evolution, if this happened 25 years ago, we were totally, totally in trouble. And then I hope that we pay attention to the health and well-being of people. And then finally, I, what I would say is keep paying attention because we're humans and we invent this amazing, cool stuff, right? So I, the, the thing that I've noticed during this pandemic is that we have just invented amazing things. So as much as I can sort of envision and dream off of the basics that were coming down the pipeline, the things that I see really coming down the pipeline, the early stuff that's just in the lab right now is so amazing. And it will really help us to create, like, like what actually the picture behind me, these are hypercells. These are carbon fiber robots that are in the lab. They're, they've been prototyped. They can actually find each other based off of a computational architect's design, and they can form structures. What if we could house all of our human beings who get displaced from climate change with these things? Uh, right? That is so, so cool. there's, yeah. there's so many cool things coming down the pipeline. We need to be paying attention. And we need to, of course, keep asking these questions about financial performance and ROI and whether or not the, the incentives align. And I think that's incredibly relevant. But we also have an R&D framework to keep in mind. So get organized, pay attention, yeah. take care of good people. So, uh, well, that actually inspires another question that I want to ask you. And I think this is going to be our last question. So I'm going to make it a big one. Um, and it's about the pandemic and all of these things that have been happening in our lives that I think have contributed to a sense of impermanence that um, we haven't felt before. Uh, many of us haven't felt before personally. Um, and of course, you know, that's also speaking from a perspective of privilege, you know, like I, I've, I've lived in a world in which I could sort of assume that my home was more or less going to stay put. Uh, and I know that's not true of many people in the world. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how um, how you think real estate will change in the face of some of these broader ex shifts that we are experiencing as a culture right now um, from the perspective of the pandemic plus climate change, you know, plus all of the social justice issues that we're dealing with. Uh, what would you like to see change about real estate uh, as a community uh, in the face of all of these things? Yeah, we um as a society, we've come an incredibly long way. So um, I do take that broader perspective that um, overall the world is getting better. So if we look at the, the spans of 1,000 to 2,000 years, we're, we've, we're doing better um, overall from a humanity perspective. 
Um, but we're at a very critical inflection point. Um, and we don't see those very often, but right now we're in a very special one. Um, climate change is a incredible issue that it will sit on the shoulders of our generation um, and that of future generations to come. They, they have no choice but to work to resolve this. You know, 50, you know, 50 percent, there, there, there's an enormous amount of cities that will be underwater. So the journal Nature had, a, you know, a phenomenal study not too long ago that essentially identified 150 million people in major cities will be underwater by 2050. So that, that's an extraordinary challenge that we need to face. Um, and it's already costing us a lot of money in the built environment. So we have a role to play in not only sort of paying attention to our own portfolios, but also paying attention to the displacement of humans around the globe, because we have to house them and we have to put them to work and that will trickle down and impact us. So we, we, we as the built environment have a huge and outsized responsibility when it comes to climate change and getting technologically and design ready for that. Um, I would say another, you know, incredible shock to our system um, that's getting ready, to, that is happening and is continuing to happen is automation. So we have somewhere between 35 to 50% of our um, job tasks that will be potentially automated between now 2030 and 2040. Um, we have somewhere in, around like 20,000 plus job tasks that we do as humanity. And that will change and expand and grow, especially because I, I take that expansive view that we will extend the margin of what we do in response to aut automation. But there will be structural problems. And so the built environment has an outsized way to look at that because actually so much of what we do is inefficient. We may pick that up through automation, but we have a mindfulness and an ethical responsibility to pay attention to how we do it. We don't want to do it like the manufacturing sector. We want to think more systematically, how about we take care of our industry and how we effectively automate, not how we displace everyone without care. So I really want to make sure that we pay attention to that because it has huge socioeconomic impacts and political impacts. We are in a mess right now, and that has a lot to do with inequality. So inequality is our next big problem. And one of the biggest factors in inequality is the built environment. Wealth is built through land and buildings. And we have a systemic problem, certainly in the United States and even across the globe, around those who are in the 90th to 99th percentile of wealth and those are that are in the 0.01 percent percentile of wealth it's a 300 percent delta in actual wealth and income it's huge so we have never faced that before that is a structural change that has happened in the past 25 years that we have never ever ever pinnacled at there are economists up and down that are very, very worried about that. And the built environment is at the center of dealing with that issue. We hold the wealth. And so we need to actually be quintessential in resolving the social inequality that arises from that. We have to, we have to yeah. be there, we will be forced to. And then finally, I'd say this is what, we've looked at the numbers in terms of how many pandemics we've had in humane, human history. This is, this is not the first pandemic. This is not the last. So let's get organized and pay attention to what we need to do to pay attention to take care of our health and well-being as we move through buildings. Um, we, knew, we know that health, uh, health and air quality are highly correlated. We've known that since 1918. Um, we know that these diseases are aerosols. I mean, it came out again that we that we had that, but um, that COVID-19 is an aerosol disease. But we do know that the health and well-being um, within buildings is a prominent problem. It's been an enormous problem for the past 100 years. And designers and, and architects and engineers, as well as people who own really good buildings, know that if I want to take care of people, I need to take care of the daylight. I need to take care of the air. Um, and I need to take care of the people inside. And when I do that, I mean, the studies are still going. I think, I think Nils, um, uh, Nils Koch and uh, Juan Palacios are, are leading some really fantastic studies along those lines to try to understand what is the productivity outcome. So I pay attention to their research there. Um, but I think what we've learned so far is that we've got a lot of work to do to pay attention to the insides of the building and improve the performance overall. 
Oh, thank you. Do it. That's a that's a wonderful it. note. <laughs> we can do it. Well, and it just as a reminder for us all that that feedback loop is so important. Um, and and I, I I think you hit on some really important things, and I don't want to I want to leave everyone with with that. But um, you know, research as a field doesn't always tell us what to do, but it does often tell us what we already did and. Um, and it helps us to learn and to think creatively about what we do next. Um, and we have done a lot of things that we need to undo. <laughs> we have done a lot of, and we also have a lot of great things that we have shown work really well for improving the planet, for improving human well-being. Uh, so it's just on us to act on that knowledge, you know. Um, so yeah, keep going. Keep yeah, going. keep going. <laughs> well, well uh, thank you. That was a wonderful note to end on. Really appreciate it. It's lovely to have you. Um, and thanks everybody for listening. That's it for this session. 